Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So uh, today we will actually talk about uh, the scaffolds. So we looked at the three different uh, arms of the tissue engineering triad, right? So we saw materials, cells and signals. So we looked at a brief inter introduction of all of these things. So today we will start with the uh, aspect which I work on which is the designing of scaffolds. So uh, we will talk about different materials that can be used for scaffolds and what, uh, what are the desired properties and so on. So the first aspect which we are going to talk about is the first type of scaffold we are going to talk about is the extracellular matrix itself. So as you know um, ECM is present uh, all through your body and that is where the cells actually attach and uh, grow. So uh, there are two aspects to understanding this uh, to be gained from this lecture. First is to understand what is the ECM and actually how uh, it is relevant for tissue engineering, right. So for us first we need to know uh, what are the components of ECM, how it is structured and so on so that we can try to mimic it. So that is a crucial aspect which we need to start with. And then we will talk about um, how uh, ECM is currently being employed in tissue engineering and there will also be a small reading assignment uh, so which is just a research article which you would have to read. Uh, which talks about using extracellular matrix uh, for tissue engineering applications. Okay. So before we go into details of uh, extracellular matrix itself, uh, what are scaffolds and what are their roles? Scaffolds have a very critical role in tissue engineering because uh, they uh, actually can direct the growth of cells. Uh, it could be either the cells which you have already seeded. So you could either place the cell seeded on the scaffolds and use the cell seeded scaffold as a tissue engineered construct or you could use only the scaffold and you might have cells migrating towards this or migrating away from this, right. So it can uh, regulate these factors. So mammalian cells as I had already mentioned are uh, anchorage dependent, uh, they are actually adherent cells. So they can, uh, they need some substrate on which they can attach and then grow. So scaffolds are the matrices which provides this type of a surface and they also provide the mechanical support for the tissue. So depending on the tissue, the mechanical properties and other physical properties can be imparted by the uh, scaffold. So the uh, cells which are uh, delivered, uh, you might want high uh, loading and you might want specific uh, cell attachment to the sites of which you are interested in. So for these types of things, you need a scaffold which needs to be engineered properly. So uh, having said this, what are the desired properties of a scaffold? Can you think of properties which you would want in a scaffold? I will write down as you shout out the answers you think of, okay. Um, mechanical properties. Okay, compatibility, mechanical properties. Biodegradability. Okay. Biodegradability, okay. So you had something. Same. Okay. Okay. What else? It should not be immunogenic. Okay. Uh, part of compatibility. Okay. Uh, high cell adherence. Okay. Cell adhesion. Okay. Porosity. High cell porosity. Okay. Why porosity? Nutrients. So the other ones are more uh, direct. We know why, but porosity uh, why? Because we will be adding molecules that should diffuse and reach the tissue. Okay. So it will help in diffusion. That is one reason. Can you think of any other reason? Cells nutrients. Cells will infiltrate. Oxygen. Oxygen and nutrients. Oxygen transfer. Okay. So toxic byproducts of cells should okay. also work. So all these are diffusion. So diffusion in and out, that is one aspect and then cells uh, in infiltration is one aspect. Okay. Uh, porosity also will give you. Uh, the real structure of an ECM, okay. It is closer to what an ECM would be. ECM has these porous matrices which in which the cells can actually adhere and grow, okay. Anything else? Non-toxic. Okay, again part of compatibility, okay. 
Is that all? You, can you think of anything else? I don't know word for it, but like there is a possibility that the scaffolds can be infected by bacteria or foreign pathogens. So okay. The, that property, I don't know what the word. Okay, so you want the scaffolds to be have, okay have. to be bacteriostatic or uh, mm-hmm. bactericidal. Yes. Okay, so that could be a desired property, but again, that can be part of compatibility, right? So it'll, again, it's. Just like how your own cells rejecting it, again having some uh, infections can also uh, pa- come as part of compatibility. But you can uh, list it as a separate property as well. So we'll just call it antibacterial. Uh, how that antibacterial uh, property is given can be discussed. And it might also depend on what type of uh, tissue you are talking about, right? So if you are talking about uh, wound dressing, which is for skins, then you might want uh, a, a very antibacterial material. Whereas if it's going to be for something else, it might not be that crucial. Okay. Okay. So uh, ability to deliver signals. Uh, can I <laughs> say it that way? Okay. Signal delivery. Anything else? Lightweight. Lightweight. Okay. Uh, why? So it's. Okay, so uh, I would say it needs to be of similar density as your natural tissue. So saying lightweight is probably not the best way to describe it because see if you are going to talk about a bone tissue that is obviously going to be heavier than a soft tissue and uh, weight is not the parameter you are looking at density which is a more uniform. So, uh, what is density compared to, uh, so what is the fundamental difference from a property standpoint between density and weight? Weight is volume based. Yeah. Okay. What if that is a property? <laughs> intensive properties and extensive properties. Okay. Intensive properties are ones which depend on size, sorry, which do not depend on size and extensive properties depend on size. So, uh, when you are talking about something like this, you are talking about the property of the material itself, not the it should not vary with the size, right? So, obviously, if you are li- replacing a large tissue, it is going to be heavier. Anyways, okay. Uh, what else? Okay. So, let us look at what I have. So, uh, many important things you have given. So, uh, support and deliver cells. Uh, so, induce, differentiate uh, and channel tissue growth, target cell adhesion substrate and stimulate cellular responses would all come under providing signals. So, these are just the different signals which we are looking at. Biocompatible, biodegradable. So, again uh, compatibility is crucial because uh, you need to make sure there are no immunogenic responses and so on. Uh, degradable depends on the type of application. So, how fast it needs to degrade or slow it needs to degrade will depend on the uh, rate of regeneration of the tissue we are t- talking about. And then uh, you have to talk about the large surface to volume ratio which is one of the aspects which porosity will provide you. And uh, when you are actually having uh, this kind of this large surface to volume ratio for the same volume of uh, implant you can actually have a lot of surface on which the cells can attach right. The cells are only seeing surfaces they are not going to see the scaffold as a whole right. So, when you provide a lot of uh, pores or if you make it into nanofibrous matrices then you have a lot of surface area come uh, for the same volume. So, this will help the cell addition and growth mechanically strong, structurally stable. Uh, so, these are all the properties which we think of from a biological standpoint. From a uh, final production and manufacturing standpoint, we need the material to be processable and malleable and it should also be sterilizable. So, there are different techniques which you can use to sterilize, but uh, wh- whatever technique you use should not affect the properties of the material, right. So, if you are going to use a, a protein on top of these uh, scaffolds or like a collagen, it should not get denatured while you are processing, while you are sterilizing it. So, these are important factors which you need to account for and uh, choosing the technique used for sterilization would also matter and you can actually design things appropriately. Okay. So, these are the desired properties you are looking for. How you provide these desired properties is the challenge. So, you need to look at what materials can be used, what chemistries can be used for cross-linking. So, depending on the level of cross-linking, your mechanical strength can actually vary and so on. Might be a silly question, but do optical properties matter when it comes to scaffolds? 
depends on which scaffold right so uh, optical property of a scaffold would matter if you are trying to engineer a cornea right if you are going to uh, an engineer a liver i don't really think uh, optical properties matter if you are going to engineer a nerve tissue then your electrical properties would matter so depending on the tissue you would have to design the properties the physical properties will primarily be dri dri driven by the type of tissue you are trying to engineer okay mechanical properties bones are going to have different properties muscles are going to have different properties and so on so what are the ro what is the role of scaffolds in vivo so it helps in constructive remodeling of a uh, functional uh, tissue uh, engineered tissue so the scaffold has to degrade and cells have to adhere migrate proliferate and differentiate 3d organization of the site uh, to form appropriate tissue should happen and it should also help in vascularization so this is what would happen when a scaffold is placed in vivo ideally right so if these things happen you know that the scaffold is doing its job so what factors will control these processes blood supply ph oxygen carbon dioxide concentration mechanical stresses uh, host surface interaction are all some of the parameters which can actually regulate uh, these things so for getting these type of scaffolds people use different materials so we will talk about some of the major classes of materials and uh, we will also look at how materials can be processed to get these types of materials so first today we will talk about extracellular matrix so extracellular matrix would be the gold standard because that's what is there in your body right so if you can get the extracellular matrix to do its job uh, if you can use that directly for tissue engineering that's what you would do but uh, what would be the limitation of doing that so if i want to use the extracellular matrix what do you think would be the limitation availability, availability is one problem okay can you think of something else compatibility, compatibility. why Okay, so uh, that is true for uh, cellular ECMs. When you decellularize it, it would not be a problem. That's what I wanted to get to. So, uh, if you actually have removed all the cells and cell debris, then the matrix itself will actually not be immunogenic because all these proteins are reasonably well conserved. So, they are conserved across uh, species. Okay, so they, it will not cause any problems. What do you mean? Uh, in vitro or yeah. vivo? In vitro. How in vitro. How would you create a decellularized ECM? So there are techniques for it. So the last few slides on this lecture will be that we'll talk about it, and the reading material will actually talk about uh, that extensively. Okay. So uh, so ECM function is to support cells, regulate polarity, cell uh, cell division, adhesion, motility. It's also involved in tissue development through cell migration, differentiation, and growth factor delivery. Okay. So ECM features uh, which we need to understand are they are stable with the ability to be reorganized, right? So uh, extracellular matrix can actually get uh, reorganized by activation by uh, action of enzymes like metalloproteases. We will talk about them, uh, but uh, it, and we also need to understand that the features of the ECM are going to be different for the different tissues. It's not going to be the same, even though we just call it as collagen. There are actually different types of collagen, and which collagen is present in uh, which part of the tissue matters. Okay. So, uh, ECM composition can be broken down to three major classes. Uh, so, basically, two major classes: proteins and proteoglycans. So, the uh, amongst proteins, there are actually two things. One is a uh, one is a structural protein, which provides the support for the uh, tissues to grow. And the other are specialized proteins which have uh, special biological functions. So the structural proteins also have some biological functions, but we will, uh, for uh, simplicity, we will classify them as only structural structural proteins. And proteoglycans are basically molecules where you have a protein core to which long glycosaminoglycans are attached. So these are complex high molecular weight components present in the ECM. They provide the viscosity and the like fluid-like nature of the ECM itself. So amongst the structural proteins, the common ones are collagen, elastin, and fibrillins. And among specialized uh, proteins, you the common ones which you see are uh, fibronectin and laminin. Okay. So we will talk about these in a little more detail. So uh, collagen is the most abundant protein by weight. Okay. So when you 
uh, are asked this question, please remember this because this is a very common question which, uh, which is asked in many places where you say what is the most common protein in the body and inevitably most people say hemoglobin which is not correct. Okay? The most common uh, protein in your body is, most abundant protein in your body is collagen. Okay? Uh, this is the structural component, it provides the support, it also can have some functional properties. So, there are actually 46 different collagen genes in the human genome and it generates 28 different types of collagen fibrils. So, uh, these are just identified using Roman numerals. So, you would have a type 1, type 2, type 3 and so on. So, the collagen fibrils are the ones which uh, provide the strength. So, the fibrils assemble to form collagen fibers and these bundles which are the collagen fibers actually impart the mechanical strength. So, they are very strong uh, structures. Types 1, 2 and 3 are the most abundant amongst which type 1 is by far the most abundant. Type 1 actually constitutes of about 90 percent of all the collagen in your human body. So, primarily type 1 is present in all over uh, in all the tissues. So, these are primarily predominantly synthesized by uh, fibroblasts. So, uh, if you culture fibroblasts and you maintain certain environment you can actually make these fibroblasts secrete collagen. So, there are labs which actually do that and uh, in our own institute Professor Verma's lab does that. So, they culture fi uh, fibroblasts to secrete uh, collagen and uh, the yield of it is always a problem. So, it depends on uh, the culture condition you, you would not know whether how much uh, of a matrix you would get. Okay. So, this is one way to get it uh, get the ECM type of a scaffold. So, epithelial cells can also synthesize some of ECM collagen. So, as I said there are 28 different types of collagen uh, fibrils and uh, these are some of the major ones. So, type 1 collagen is seen in uh, skin, tendon, vascular, ligature, uh, organs, bones. So, this is the main component in bones. Okay. So, uh, collagen component of bone is primarily type 1 and you have type 2 collagen which is mainly seen in cartilage and type 3 collagen is seen in uh, reticular fibers along with type 1. And type 4 is seen in the basement membrane. So, basement membrane uh, is the one which separates the, uh, the tissue from the uh, matrix. So, you would have that uh, in the basement membrane. And type 5 is uh, seen in hair and nail. Okay. So, they have different uh, mechanical properties, they actually uh, have different significantly different physical properties and they are seen in different tissues. So, this is uh, what the collagen um, fibril looks like. So, this is a triple helix which you see. So, this is a mature type 1 collagen and uh, so basically what happens is uh, they are initially synthesized as pre pro proteins. So, a pro protein is one which uh, basically a pre protein precursor when these have uh, these come along with the signal peptide they are called pre pro proteins. So, you have pre pro collagen which is usually synthesized. So, uh, from here from this there are actually a lot of uh, co and post translational modifications which happen for the collagen to form the fibrils. So, collagen monomers which are called the alpha chains uh, self associate into triple helical structure. So, collagen has a triple helical structure basically which are called the collagen fibrils uh, contain, contain two identical alpha chains and a third alpha chain which is different. Okay. So, the type 1 collagen itself is encoded by uh, collagen call 1 A1 and col 1 A2. So, there are actually two uh, alpha helices from uh, col 1 A1 and one uh, from col 1 A2. Okay. So, uh, these three form the triple helix which is shown here. So, the two blue ones are the collagen 1 alpha 1 and the red one is the collagen 1 alpha 2. So, from this they form the triple helix which uh, forms the collagen uh, type 1 fibril. So, this process actually shows the uh, synthesis of collagen. So, what you have is collagen fibers are produced from uh, a pro alpha chain. So, this pro alpha chain then, so some of it is done intracellularly and some of it is done extracellularly. So, the ones you see after secretion we have after uh, this point type uh, after the sixth step is the all extracellular. So, until then it is intracellular. So, you have uh, synthesis of uh, pro alpha chains which is the first step and then you have hydroxylation of selected prolines and lysines. So, uh, collagen primarily has glycine uh, as the amino acid 
and the next uh, to that is uh, proline and hydroxyproline. Okay. So, uh, you have uh, hydroxylation of certain prolines and lysines. So, the prolines uh, are actually hydroxylated and uh, so are the lysines, some lysines are hydroxylated and this hydroxy lysines are then uh, glycosylated. So, once these glycosylated uh, hydroxy lysines are present, you have self assembly of the 3 uh, pro, -alpha, pro alpha chains uh, to form a pro collagen triple helix. So, this pro collagen triple helix is secreted and uh, outside what happens is the pro peptides are cleaved and finally, you have a self assembly to form the fibril. So, these fibrils are about 10 to 300 nanometers uh, thick. So, what happens is these individual collagen molecules, the triple helix molecules uh, are cross linked uh, using uh, by the actual activation of an enzyme. So, okay. anyway, so uh, by the action of an enzyme you have a cross linking which is done. Depending on the cross linking, uh, you would actually have uh, the strength. Okay. So, once more and more uh, uh, collagen uh, triple helices are cross linked, you would have very thick fibrils and these uh, fibrils all aggregate to form a collagen fiber. So, this collagen fiber is what forms the matrix. Okay. So, this is a typical process for uh, type 1 collagen and you can actually find similar processes for other collagens as well. Okay. So, depending on the uh, initial uh, pre protein, so initial chain alpha chains which are used, you would get different types of collagen. Okay. So, this is uh, from basic cell biology. So, you do not need to know the process or this biosynthetic pathways of collagen. However, what you might want to know is what are the molecules which are the precursors for collagen. Okay. So, if you have that you could probably try to use them for your uh, tissue engineering applications or you can try to understand some of the pathway where you can push towards the generation of collagen. So, you could try in vivo secretion of collagen as a way of uh, regenerating tissues. Okay. So, uh, elastins and fibrillins are found in tissues that undergo significant stretching or bending as you uh, as the name suggests they have elastic properties. So, examples would be large arteries, lungs and skin. So, these actually go through a lot of the stretching and uh, bending right. So, uh, some physical mechanical stresses are experienced by these. So, you would have a lot of elastin or fibrillins. So, this is uh, they are found as specialized types of fibrils which are called as elastic fibers. Uh, the elastic fibers contain large masses of uh, cross-linked el elastin uh, interspersed with uh, fibrillins. So, you, uh, the elastic fibers primarily contain elastin and there is some amount of fibrillins as well. So, uh, elastin is basically synthesized as a precursor called tropoelastin and tropoelastin has uh, two major types uh, of alternating domains. One is a hydrophilic domain which is rich in uh, lysine and alanine and the other is a hydrophobic domain which is rich, rich in valine, uh, valine, proline and uh, glycine. So, the hydrophobic domain provides the elasticity. So, uh, so if, if you are going to design uh, polypeptides to prepare scaffolds, then uh, providing these types of uh, amino acids, using these types of amino acids will give you the elastic property which you are looking for. So, tropoelastin is expressed and then secreted as mature protein into the ECM and after secretion and alignment with the ECM, elastin monomers are cross linked and uh, so this uh, 3 lysine derived aldehydes uh, cross link with an unmodified lysine to form a tetrafunctional structure which is called as the uh, desmosine. So, this is the uh, elastin fiber which would which you would have and uh, the other major component in the uh, elastic fiber is the fibrillin. So, there are actually 3 fibrillin genes in humans and uh, fibrillin 1 is the most abundant and it serves as the scaffold for uh, elastic fibers uh, after in cross linking with the elastin itself. So, this gene uh, expression is consistent with the role in the ECM. So, uh, FB1, FBN1 which is fibrillin 1 is secreted mostly by uh, cells from a mesenchymal origin. It is seen a lot in bones. Uh, FBN2 is uh, secreted highest in uh, fetal cells whereas, FBN3 is expressed in embryonic and fetal tissues. Okay, so, uh, some of these are not seen very commonly in adult tissues. 
So, those were the structural components. So, you also had functionalized uh, functional proteins. Uh, so, couple of functional proteins which we had mentioned were fibronectin and laminin. So, fibronectin is uh, a major component of major uh, fibrolar glycoprotein in the ECM. It has a role in uh, attaching cells to all matrices except for uh, collagen type 4. Type 4, when you have a type 4 uh, matrix, laminin is involved in the cell adhesion. So, uh, what happens is this, these have a multimodular structure uh, with three different amino acid repeat domains and uh, these are called uh, FN1, FN2 and FN3. And the primary amino acid sequence that binds to the integrin uh, which is expressed on the cells is the RGD domain. So, arginine, glycine and aspartate. So, the fibronectin actually provides this type of a motif on which the cells can actually attach. So, that is why uh, fibronectin is even used for coating of cell culture plates and uh, other things where you can ensure cells are attached to the surface. Okay. So, uh, people also use RGD domains. So, you can create these uh, tripeptides and use them along with your scaffolds to promote uh, cell adhesion. If you do not, if you, if you cannot use fibronectin to get uh, like all of fibronectin, you can create these short peptides which can be used and uh, that will help in cell adhesion. So, uh, fibronectin exists as uh, soluble protein and insoluble protein. Soluble protein is present in the blood plasma. Uh, it is involved in uh, blood clotting process and links to fibrin during that process. You have insoluble protein in the ECM where ECM fibronectin uh, actually has the polypeptide segments uh, which alters the morphology and uh, helps in the cell at, uh, attachment. So, you have laminins uh, which are another set of glycoproteins, they constitute the structural scaffolding for all base, basement membranes. So, if you remember we also said that collagen type 4 is involved in basement membranes, right. So, along with collagen type 4 you would have laminin uh, existing so that it can help in cell attachment. This is a very critical component of the ECM because it has a lot of functions. It can actually bind with the integrins and other receptors, many other receptors. Uh, and it is involved in cell differentiation, cell movement, shape of the cell and promotion of cell survival even. So, because of this it plays a crucial role and it, it is actually present uh, in reasonable abundance. Uh, it is a heterotrimeric protein that contains an alpha chain, a beta chain and a gamma chain. So, which is what is shown here. So, it can also be called as a beta 1 chains and beta 2 chains which is the traditional uh, way it was represented. So, there are at least 15 different types of heterotrimers that have been identified. The common structural features uh, which you would see are uh, having a tandem distribution of uh, globular and rod like and coiled uh, domains. So, that is what is a laminin and this is the general representation of the laminin structure. So, other than these we also have uh, proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. So, glycosaminoglycans are the most abundant heteropolysaccharides uh, which are seen and they are basically long unbranched polysaccharides with uh, repeating disaccharide units. So, instead of having a random chain you would have disaccharides which are repeated uh, and then these are highly negatively charged uh, with extended uh, conformation that can impart uh, viscosity. They also show very low compressibility. So, because of these properties they are uh, used as uh, lubricating agents in the joints. So, you would see these materials like hyaluron and, uh, and so on, a uh, chondroitin sulphate in the joints and these all of these occur in different uh, tissues. You can actually uh, look it up on the net and you would see that there are tables which explain where these can be found. So, uh, some of the common uh, glycosaminoglycans are hyaluronic acid, dermatan sulphate, uh, chondroitin sulphate, heparin, heparan sulphate and uh, keratin sulphate. So, these are all commonly seen in your body. So, proteoglycans uh, are basically glycosaminoglycans that are linked to core proteins which are rich in uh, serine and threonine. Uh, they make sure that uh, the fluidity of this of the tissue is maintained and they provide resistance to compressive forces. So, they play a crucial role in making sure the tissue maintains the gel like structure which it gel like feature which it has. So, when we talk about uh, ECM we also need to understand that ECM is not a static matrix. 
it is getting reorganized. So, you can have proteolytic degradation uh, to remove the ECM. So, some of the uh, enzymes which are involved in this are matrix metalloproteases and serine proteases. So, they will degrade the tissue and as I already said many different types of cells are involved in secreting these ECM matrices to actually continuously remodel these tissues. Okay. So, when you talk about ECM in tissue engineering, what people are doing is people are harvesting ECM uh, for tissue engineering applications. So, they take uh, the tissue and uh, so either it can be allogenic or even xenogenic ECMs and they decellularize it. Uh, and it is well tolerated by human hosts because ECM components are well conserved. Okay. So, decellularization is very crucial uh, because the cellular antigens are actually foreign. Even if you uh, get it from an allogenic source, uh, you would have to make sure that there is proper tissue type matching if you are going to have the cells along with it. So, if there is no cells then it, it cannot trigger immune responses or inflammatory responses. So, for that reason you have to carefully decellularize it, uh, you, there are many techniques to do it to remove all the cells. So, decellularized ECM can actually be an off the shelf product. So, uh, this can provide a favorable environment for constructive remodeling, uh, these can be seeded uh, with autologous cells before implanting if you want. So, then you have a patient specific personalized medicine, right. So, because uh, ECM is common for everybody then you do not have to worry about that. Now, the cells which can create the immunogenic response are from the patient himself which means there is no risk of rejection. So, you can tailor it that way. So, uh, once you have it in, uh, inside then in vivo environment will determine the remodeling of the ECM. So, people have done in vitro experiments to study the effect of uh, the possible stresses such decellularized ECM can go through. So, there are uh, uh, different techniques to do it, but what is the fundamental goal of decellularization? What do you want to accomplish? I said wh why we want to accomplish that, but what do you want to accomplish? What are all the things which you want to remove when you are talking about decellularization? Okay. So, you want to prevent any immune response. For doing that, what are all that you should remove? Like removing cells is the general thing, but uh, there can cell receptors. Cell receptors, okay. So antibodies. antibodies. So any cell debris, any cell debris okay. So that's actually what you want to do. But uh, specifically, what you try to do is you want to remove all cellular and nuclear material. Uh, you, while you are doing this, you want to maintain the composition and mechanical properties and biological activity of the uh, ECM. So, that is the challenge. So, removing all cells is not too difficult. Uh, see, I can always uh, take an ECM and dip it in sulfuric acid, right? So, uh, the idea is to remove the cells without damaging the ECM. So, how you go about doing that is the processing part which makes it unique. So, there are a combination of mechanical, physical and enzymatic processes which are done. So, mechanical process would be the simple delamination of layers. So, this is nothing but just stripping of layers. So, you take out one layer and then strip out the first layer which might just be, which might contain too many cells and you take that out and then you can have physical uh, things like sonication, freezing and thawing and so on, right. So, sonication will destroy the cells, will just uh, rupture the cells. And you can freezing and thawing can also do the same, have the same effect. So, these are just uh, cell disruption techniques. And then you can use enzymatic treatment like trypsin. So, trypsin can uh, remove the cells from their adhesion sites and uh, trypsinization is done even when you do cell, cell culture, right. So, you can do trypsin treatment. And then uh, you can also use uh, chemical treatments like detergents and ionic solutions. So, you need to be careful with what you, what exactly you are doing and how exactly you are processing it. So, mechanical uh, process of delamination needs to be done with reasonable care. So, it could just be a physical brushing of things could be as simple as that people actually do that, but it could also be a lot more complicated with uh, designing well controlled equipment. So, it depends on how you want to design the process. So, these are just general uh, techniques. So, we will go uh, you can go into the great details of the techniques when you read the reading assignment. Because uh, if I were to describe materials and methods for each of these, it might be too, too much information. Okay. So, these are some of the commercial ECM based products which are currently available. Uh, graft jacket 
is a, a product where you, human dermal collagen matrix is used. So, this provides a supplemental support and protection and reinforcement, uh, reinforcement for tendon and ligamentous tissue. So, this is also used for covering the periosteal patch uh, and uh, it, pro it acts as a protection and support for bone and tendons during foot, ankle and hand surgery. So, this is just collagen matrix which is cross linked. So, they take the human dermal from skin, they take the collagen and they create a cross linked matrix which can be used for these applications. Uh, tissue mend is uh, from fetal bovine skin and um, this is also again used for musculotendinous uh, defects. Zimmer is a collagen repair matrix uh, which is used which is an acellular scaffold of collagen and elastin uh, derived from porcine dermal tissue. So, there is a so, as I was saying the uh, these proteins are very well conserved okay. So, they do not cause any uh, immune reactions mostly as long as you remove all the cells and the cell debris the, the chance of immune responses are very low. So, that is why people work most of the times when people work with collagen it is not that they are using human collagen right. So, if you go back and look at literature people use collagen from so many different sources it could be from fish it could be from rats could be from chicken and just take it from anywhere and you can start using it from uh, bovine and so on right. So, because it is collagen is collagen it is just a protein and it is reasonably well conserved uh, to ensure there is no effect. And as far as the glycosaminoglycans these are carbohydrates right these are uh, just molecules which are going to have the same structure it does not matter where it comes from. So, because of this reason uh, you can actually use it from xenogenic sources as well. So, um, Zimmer collagen patch is from pigs and so is permacol. Uh, so, this is again a decellularized cross linked uh, porcine implant which is being used for different applications. So, these are all some of the commercial products and uh, as far as gra uh, graft jacket goes they actually have a, a nice representation of what it actually uh, how they prepare it and what actually they expect to have. So, they take a human tissue which is basically the dermal tissue here and they treat it with uh, they remove all the cellular components and retain collagen, elastin and the proteoglycans and make sure that the matrix is intact. So, this creates the graft jacket products which they commercialize and this is by some right on uh, the company's name. So, uh, this reduces the rejection response because the cellular components are gone. Uh, this will also help in uh, repo uh, revascularization and cellular uh, repopulation because you have all the pores and all the structures necessary for vascular network to be created. So, this will also have a minimized uh, inflammatory response based on primate studies that they have shown. So, this is the so and they hope this will regenerate normal tissue. So, this is a commercial product which is available for uh, different applications. So, uh, with that we come to the conclusion for this lecture on this topic. So, this is the reading assignment which I was talking about. Uh, so, there are actually multiple uh, of this kind of work which has been done. So, here what they have done is regeneration and uh, experimental orthotopic transplantation of a bioengineered kidney. So, they have taken a kidney and uh, decellularized it and seeded it again to create uh, a functional kidney which they have placed it in a different position that is what orthotopic transplantation is. So, so, they keep it in a different position and then uh, uh, see how exactly uh, the kidney functions. So, they have done it in in vivo small animal studies in this paper I believe. So, go back and read this paper there are many other papers as well. So, th this is uh, a paper where people have done for the entire organ unlike a, just a small patch or something. So, the other commercial materials are just patches you take the skin and you take the collagen cr cross link it and use it as a patch. Right. So, unlike that this is slightly different ok.